showers, highest temperatures of 11 or 12 degrees. Now you're up to date on News Talk. The Football Show on Off the Ball with Paddy Power. Fake crowd noise. The Emirates never sounded so good. Gamble responsibly. See I'm prepared to edit and I can't well, do it then. Again. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. It's Thursday's football show. Nathan with you for the next hour. 53106 is the text number. We're going to do one final bit of reflection on what went on with the Republic of Ireland over the last week. Noel King will join us at about half past nine. The Burnley centre half, Jimmy Dunn, is standing by to chat to us in just a moment. But just a couple of bits and pieces to get through. And news just in from the FAI that Shamrock Rovers' next three fixtures, including tomorrow's game against Derry City, have all been postponed. As we heard earlier today, Aaron Green testing positive for COVID-19. Jack Byrne, it emerged, was the Republic of Ireland player who tested positive at the weekend. And a high number of close contacts have been identified within the Shamrock Rovers squad. So that means their upcoming games against Derry, Finn Harps and St. Patrick's Athletic have all been postponed. It means that they're going to have to put the champagne on ice around Rovers for a little while before they can claim that league title. Bohemians in the last few minutes as well have also confirmed that a first team player has tested positive for COVID-19 and that another deemed a close contact is also self-isolating as a result. As it stands though, their game away to Dundalk tomorrow is set to go ahead. Both say they have made no request for the game to be rescheduled and are happy to proceed with the fixture as planned. So this is going to become part and parcel of the game. Premier League back at the weekend, the Merseyside Derby on Saturday morning, Manchester City and Arsenal on Saturday evening and two live games as always on Off the Ball on Sat on Sunday. We're starting at two o'clock, Crystal Palace against Brighton with Kenny Cunningham and Stephen Doyle and then myself and Brian Kerr will bring you Spurs against West Ham from half past four. Our next guest needs to wait until Monday. It'll be an all St. Kevin's boys centre-back clash when West Brom go head-to-head -head with Burnley. Jimmy Dunn is on the line. Evening, Jimmy. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Yourself and Darrow O'Shea potentially going head-to-head -head on that would be, Monday. That would be brilliant to represent St. Kevin's in, uh, in England. It would be amazing. It is a remarkable production line. Jeff Hendrick... Robbie Brady, Jack Byrne, yeah. and that's just the current crop. It feels as though it's never ending. What, what age were you when you went into Kevin's first? I was maybe twelve years old. Right. So you're. And there was there was an eliteness about there was just some some sort of eliteness about playing for St Kevin's. I, I don't know what it is because it's um, it wasn't a local team as such. I went from playing with my local team, Rock Celtic, to St Kevin's, and it really felt like a big move at the time. And. The coaching was so elite and the, the players were like the, the best from in around Dublin, so it was, it was great. So you were playing with your local club up in Loud? Yeah, I was playing with my local club um, and going going from there, which was brilliant for me. I was pl just playing with my mates and enjoying my football, but going from there to St. Kevin's boys was was, was different. They, um, we had like all the best players from around the, around the country, um, particularly in around Dublin. And it was really competitive for the age. It was, we wanted to win everything. We wanted to beat Malahide and beat Cherry Orchard. It was really important to us to beat all these teams. So did you get a sense, even at that age, like you're, you're not even a teenager, you're heading down to St. Kevin's Boys, that actually not everybody gets this chance, that I'm at a very high level, and if I make a go of this, if it's the right attitude, that there's some big opportunities here for me? Yeah, at the time, it, at the time, it, well, that was the opportunity. Like it, it couldn't get bigger. It, right. it couldn't get bigger at that age and playing for Kevin's boys because there was uh, everything that came at like who was going to get picked for the DDSL. Um, Did you play Kennedy Cup? Played Kennedy Cup, um, yeah, and there was also the Cashing Cup. There was a few other, a few important cups to win. Then there was just winning the All Ireland with St Kevin's, which was huge. Um, and winning the league with St Kevin's was, was was really important at that age. I kind of look back and laugh now, but we took it really, really seriously. And our, our coaching was intense and we trained really, really hard at that age. And some of the players were really good. And then, um, you know, you, you said a few names there over the years that went abroad and have done really well in England that have been at St Kevin's. It's interesting you talk about the importance of actually winning something with the club because... A team like St. Kevin's, now you look at them as that conveyor belt. If it's all about getting players 
across to England. I know it's changed now in the link up with the League of Ireland teams, but that it is to get players to play at the highest elite level possible. You almost forget that there's that Dublin rivalry that all these big clubs, you want to be winning, you want to be winning trophies and medals at 14, 15. Like, w when you're talking to your coaches and people around the club at that stage and, and your family are involved, is it focus on this, focus on winning these matches, focus on lifting these trophies? Or are you already talking about what the next step is and what you need to do in terms of your development to actually be able to make yeah. it somewhere else? Yeah, I never, I never, um, I never thought about my development as a, as a player at that age. Um, I never thought about what what the really big next step would be. Obviously, you have, you have clubs and scouts coming to games, and that was really exciting and, and couldn't you? But I never really thought about it too much. It was, it was more important to me to, um, to beat Malahide in the cup final, or you know, it was like going to going crumbling away. It was what a hard game that was. Like <laughs> all these. You know what I mean? And that was just really important at the time. And um, I know that when it started, maybe when I got to the age of 13 and, and all these possibilities, you're then old enough to go on trial at clubs and stuff. Then it started getting a little bit more complicated. And I ended up having to go back to my local club, Rock Celtic, to enable me the opportunity to go on trial more. Um, and it was weighing up what's more important, playing these games for St. Kevin's or or going on going on trial because I know it wasn't always pleasing for the club if I, I would miss a game to go on, on trial at a club. But when I was um playing with my local team Rock Celtic, it was, you know, just you know, do what's best for the kids, do go where you need to go. So after a year or two St. Kevin's I ended up having to go back to Rock right. Celtic to enable me to do that more. Where'd you go on trials? Oh, as a kid, there, you know, so we used to go away, there's a few scouts. I think my, my first trial was at Man United. Um I found it really tough, um, and then from there, every couple of weeks, I, I know I, I tried at Aston Villa and, and Chelsea, um, and Newcastle, and I spent a little, a little spell maybe with Dara at West Brom, and went to a few tournaments at them, and that's what you could do. That's what you could do because I, I wasn't, I wasn't full time with a team. Yeah, I didn't, you know, you and loads of us did that. All all the boys did that. Um, loads of my loads of the lads was just from Kevin's. You go and trial one place one week and somewhere else the next week and you'd see who liked you and what you liked and, and that's what that's kind of what we used to do. I mean, it was more difficult than say Kevin's boys because they were really competitive, you know. Um but that's where you would get spotted playing for St. Kevin's in, in these games. That's where the uh that's where the scouts would go to to watch you. So that was massive for me. Um that's that's probably where um, that's probably where these, these scouts saw me play at that young age. What was it you found about that first trial at United that was so tough? Yeah, it was a completely different world. Like, uh, like a, a, a young, uh, like a complete cosy from, from County Loud. Like what age are you? I'm, t I'm, 20, I'm 22 when, when, now. When you went to United, what age were you? Well, I went to my, my first trial, I was 13. Wow, right. Um, and I was, yeah. And like, Are you getting look, on the plane was... by yourself or is someone going over with you? I think the first time I went over, I went with uh, the scout Walter Murphy, mm. um, who was who was brilliant, and maybe a few other boys, um, and then it got to the stage where maybe I'd I'd go every um, every school break. Then when I got a bit older, or certainly through most of the most of the summer holidays, um, and then I'd maybe I got to the stage where I was missing a lot of school, and I was going over on trial maybe every couple of weeks. Um, and it, it got a bit once I once I, I settled in, but at the start it was a complete shock to the system. First thing was playing football um at that intensity every day. It was like I played football every day anyway, but to enjoy it. This was like intense training every day and I was absolutely shattered at that age. Um and then there was the whole feeling of like, wow, these boys are amazing, like you know, back home, I thought I was a superstar. Over here it's different. Yeah. You know, the, there's lads coming on trial from Brazil and Spain and it's like <laughs> this is crazy. Who, can you can you remember anyone who was there? Well, my my youth team then we mm. well, I ended up having a really lucky my um my youth team turned into a really successful one that uh, the group of lads I was with so obviously Marcus Rash was doing amazing, um Scotty McTomney's doing amazing um you, you a few other boys um as well who have like Tim Foster Mens is playing at my United Axel Finzebi's playing at my United Dean Henderson's obviously obviously pushing now for that first spot as well. So I had a really tough group, a really competitive group. And um, at the time, I felt really frustrating. How the lads are, oh, everyone's really, really good. Like, this is tough. Looking back at it now, it was obviously brilliant for me because I was I was mixing with some really, yeah. really good players and learning so much. So it was brilliant. 
what was Rashford like as a, a 15, 16 year old, both in terms of ability, but as a personality? Because we've seen what he's done off the pitch over the last six months, and he's an MBE now. He's such a leader in terms of world football, for what footballers can be away from the game itself. Yeah. What are your memories of him when he was a kid? Yes, what what he's done now is amazing. Obviously, you could never predict that he'd he'd, he'd go and um, be such do such a role things off the pitch as he is. But one thing I always knew about him was he, he would always take responsibility. So I can see that he's uh, I can understand how he feels the need that he's seen something that needs fixed and he's, he's taken upon himself to go and fix it because he he did that on the on the pitch. You know, we were maybe. 13, 14 years old. If we were losing, Marcus could win the game by himself, um, and he would really he would take that pressure amongst himself. Um, as a lad, just uh, the nicest kind of sweetest kid ever. Not uh, never really got carried away, or, um, but at the same time knew how good he was. Um, mm. Full of full of confidence, but the the nicest kid ever. But yeah, it's, um, I mean, he should be incredibly proud of what he's gone and done both on and off the pitch now. But I'm lucky enough to be surrounded by some of these guys and obviously it's um, it's brushed off on me, hopefully in, in some way or another. When his chance came up as a 17-year-old, he obviously took it with both hands straight away and made this brilliant burst into life at Old Trafford with goals in the Europa League yeah. and followed it up in the league. In terms of his talent at, at that young age, like did he have it all at, at a very young age? Like was it, was it all there? Was it just a matter of him seeing it through to the first team? I, I I thought so, yeah. I thought he was incredibly talented. Like his skills and, and his technique is something that I've, I don't think I've ever seen like like amazing. Um, but at the same time, there's loads of youngsters like that mm. um, who are incredibly talented at that age. And it either goes to your head or you're getting fed the wrong ideas or there's a million reasons why, why you can't go and push on and keep doing it. Marcus never kind of fell off the horse. He kept going. As good as he was, he worked incredibly hard. Um, knew what he needed to improve on, um, but kept getting better at what he was good at. Um, always scored goals, and when he got his opportunity for the first team, he scored two in his debut, and then he, he just kicked on, kept pushing, kept pushing, and never had that relentlessness. Uh, he never really took his foot off the gas, um, and you know that's that's so important. Yeah, how long were you in the academy then at United for? So I spent four years as a, as a Man United player and, and went straight to Burnley from there. At what stage do you decide you need to leave? Like at what stage? Because I'm sure during those four years you're dreaming of what happens to Marcus Rashford, which is you make the instant impact. Yeah. You've made your way to the Premier League now, but I suppose when you're 14, 15, you're thinking, I can get right in there. Maybe, maybe I'll get a chance. Maybe I'll get an injury. At what stage does something happen where you think, you know what, actually... As difficult as the decision to make, Manchester United yeah. maybe isn't the best place for my development. Yeah, well, look, there's at that age, there's, there's, there was no place I wanted to be other than there. Like that was the, that was the top for me, and I was chuffed. Like I, I didn't, didn't really ever want to go anywhere else. Um, like I had a roller coaster, uh, uh, like of emotions as a, as a young kid there. Like I spent maybe like thirteen months um, out with hip operations and. And like struggled to find my feet again, and then I grew like all the, like huge amounts in no time, and like I was all over the place. And then I had to try and I, I spent a lot of the time I was 17, 18 year olds trying to get games for the under 16s because I just needed to find my feet again. And then it was, and then I thought I got back on the horse, and I was playing games for the 18s. It was going really well, and by the end of my scholarship, I had a year. Um, left at Man United, and I, ha I had a conversation with Nicky Butt, and he said, "You know, you can you can stay, and you can try and you can try and fight, and maybe turn things around in the last year of, of your deal. But we highly recommend that you go. This opportunity at Burnley has come for you, and it's it's hard for lads to get released and find clubs again that quickly. And we highly recommend that you go and you uh, you take this opportunity at Burnley. And at the time, it broke my heart. I was like, I want to be a Man United player. Like this is like." Where I want to be, I want to, yeah, I want to stay in five for my last year. But having conversations with the people that were closest to me, um, my agents are, are, are brilliant for me at the time. This, they, um, we all came to agreement that this was best, and um, this was best for me, and that um, my development would be better elsewhere, and especially at Burnley, with maybe the, the, the type of player I, I could have become and what they were going to coach me and, and turn me into. Um, I didn't see it at the time, but now I'm just so grateful that I am. Um, I was able to walk into a club like that who are developing me the way they are now. Yeah, and so you talk I feel about, lucky. 
yeah, the, the players who were at, in that academy, the homegrown talent like Marcus Rashford, but also players coming from every yeah. part of the world to make it at a young age at United yeah. is it's practically impossible. It's a miracle anybody comes through at this stage. And yeah. you don't have to look too far. Somebody like Robbie Brady, who probably faced a similar decision at a very similar age. I don't know if you, if you had a chat with him around the time as to what, what the yeah. best route was. Yeah, it gets it does. It gets to a stage where like Rob like Robbie was I remember Robbie at, at that age, like when he was eighteen, nineteen, he was oh my god, he was incredible and I definitely would have thought, you know, if, if I was giving advice to Rob back then, I said, Rob, stick around, you'll get more of a chance. You're like yeah, incredible or whatever. But he obviously in similar thought that no, my my development might be better elsewhere and I might be able to push on and go further and um, get past some of these players that I'm competing with now if if I go somewhere else and maybe take a, take a step back in order to take two steps forward. So um, that's what he did. That's what loads of lads have had to do. Um, some players, it, it affects them more than others. And, and then I've, I've tried to, to make it work for me and learn as much as I can and, and keep pushing. And you got yourself back all the way to the top of the ladder. You make your Premier League debut last month. You score in your Premier League debut. But again, it's not straightforward. You go out in loan, you're in Barrow in non-league, you're in Akron and Stanley in League Two, you go up to Scotland with Hearts, you're at Sunderland and Fleetwood in, in the First Division. Like, yeah. Again, all of this is happening at a very young age. Like, leaving yeah. United is, like, is that a moment, do you think, in 20 years' time you're still going to look back on and actually, you know, everything changed for me there in a, in a good way? That, like, did you have to grow up very quickly when you left United? Like, going to Barrow National League as a 17-year-old, I'd say, is pretty tough. Going, going from Man United, where like my kit smells like roses, to eighteen months later, playing for Barrow, where it's like you wash your own kit and who do you think you are, is was the biggest, probably the biggest shock in my life at that stage. But I, the only way I'd give myself credit for is that I, I felt like I really took it on. I felt like I understood my situation. Like I, I had a, a year at Burnley in the under twenty threes before I went out on loan. So when I got released from my United, I spent a year at Burnley's under twenty threes. And and then went on this journey, this embarked on all these journeys on my loans. I feel like that that season I had at Burnley, my first season, probably I probably grew and developed more than I did in in the previous five or six years anyway, because I, I learned so much and it really it it built me and enabled me to go and and have all these loans in the, in the man's game, just probably because of the attitude that's at Burnley, the real um, hard work and desire and the the ethics that are at the club um i needed all that i needed that like when i first came in um i was probably thought it was too big for my boots there was loads of little things that people needed to help me with um loads of little bits of my game taking the ball down in the wrong areas all the all these little things and um, that might have been acceptable at man united but in kind of not in the real world but in a lot of levels of football aren't uh, aren't good enough um and Burnley, just I, I developed so much at Burnley. I got coached really well, and and from there, it, you know, going and playing in, in the conference, um, where everything's so tough, so aggressive, and me being quite slight and, and skinny, that was an amazing um, experience. And from there, I, I tried to build as much as I could. The loan at Fleetwood broke down. It, Joey Barton didn't seem particularly happy yeah. with something. Yeah. I don't know if you have you spoken about this about what happened. It all seemed I've a bit mysterious. Spoken. Yeah, yeah. I've not spoken publicly about it. I'm sure I will one day. Like it's quite, uh, it's quite bizarre. And for another word, like uh, I, I won't really know how to explain it. But it's um, get it, get it off your chest now, Jimmy. Yeah, I know. I would. Yeah, I would love to. Like we, we, we came to a. I did get it. What can I say and get away with it? I got accused of something that was uh, relatively bizarre, bizarre and w w kind of will never be able to put our finger on and. Um, and I will come out and speak about it one day, and it's really, it's really not a big deal. But at, at the time, um, we just kind of felt, you know, maybe it's, it's better. I'm, I'm, I'm not here at all, and I, I go back and continue my development at Burnley. And mm. um, it was coming up to the January window anyway, um, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a huge fall out. But you know, Joe, Joey's Joey. I'm not the first guy to fall out with Joey Barton, and won't be the last. No, and so, um, certainly, but because it's Joey Barton, it becomes big news, and somebody falling out with yeah, Joey Barton yeah. is big news. And like, we, is any part of you again concerned that, wow, suddenly I'm in the paper, suddenly my name has been thrown about for a falling out, and I'm going back to Burnley, and Sean Dyche is reading this, and is he going to be questioning my character? Is he going to be asking what happened yeah. here? Is, is this a guy I want around the place? Was, was, was that going through your head at all? 
Um, look, I've been at Burnley like for for four or five years. Um, Burnley know me better than anybody, and I've had five. I've had one, two, three, five or six loans prior to my loan at Fleetwood. And I know one thing: if you speak to any of my previous managers, that they, if they question anything about me, it, it won't be my character or my or my work ethic. Um, you know, and Burnley, Burnley know that. Burnley aware of that, and, and Burnley are the exact same. The the, the reward I, I've I've been given by. Uh, the gaffer now is is through my hard work, and um, so one thing I know that, that they've never questioned is is um, my intentions um, and my attitude. So um, thankful, thankful for that. So um, you know, but like like I say, I, I won't be the I won't be the last one to fall out with Joey. And um, I'd be more concerned if it was a, a falling out with um, with another manager who you wouldn't usually who wouldn't usually fall out with people. But I mean, this mm. is just. This is uh, just the game. I have to be mature enough to get on with it and, and take it on the chin and, and just concentrate my footy again. Did you know when you were coming back to Burnley that that was it? You were back for the long haul? Like maybe you're not back for the long haul. Maybe there's more plans yeah. for loan spells. But did you think, actually, no. I'm, I'm done with the nomadic life. I need to settle down. Yeah, there, there was a part of me coming there. I mean, loans are, loans are brilliant to develop. Um, and I had loads of them. Um, I had loads of good ones and some not so good ones. Um, but loans are going to be like that. I mean, you can't expect to play for five clubs in, or six clubs in three seasons and for it to go well all the time, you know, moving house and moving um, moving around the country, going from uh, Preston, living in Preston, to living in Edinburgh, to living in Newcastle. To, uh, you know, it, it is it is tough. Uh, it's brilliant. It's so exciting. But it, there are going to be challenges and you are going to come across people um, that you're going to have to learn how to deal with. I've had experience now. I've, I've dealt with some some people and I've matured from it and learned from it. And I'm going to take it into my next experience. But um, do you need probably, to remind yourself of that? Like, yeah, you know, when you are out playing in non-league or League Two, and you're not only you're away from home, you you've also in some ways have had the dream dashed of the straightforward route through at Old Trafford. Of you know what, this is yeah. still living a life that so many people would work so hard for. I just need to stick at it and keep yeah. my head down. Yeah, there, like there is that. Some some players are absolutely fair play to them. They go to a, a big academy, a big club, and they do really well and they get their opportunity and they play in the first team at 17 or 18 and, and they ride off into the sunset and it's brilliant. Um, and that was that was obviously what you think is going to happen when you come over at that age. Um, no one ever ever told me that there was a, a possibility of it going a complete other way and I might have to forge a career for myself in a completely different manner. Um, but once it started happening and I came to terms with it, I was just really determined to try and make it work. And I'm obviously still continuing to try and do that. Like I've only played a couple of games now. There's there's a lot of work to do and I've got loads I really want to achieve. Um, but I'm enjoying the journey. I'm sure you wouldn't change going to Manchester United, but if you're... Signed by Manchester United, you obviously would have had plenty of options elsewhere. And like Manchester United, I'd imagine as a young player in an academy, they want you to play a certain way. Like they're preparing you to yeah. play in a team that generally is going to dominate possession. Probably when you're playing underage games, you're playing in a team that's the best team out there. Like, that's not Barrow. That's not Burnley either. It's it's a totally different yeah. type of defending. Football. How do you go yeah. through that process of literally changing the footballer you are? Yeah, like the things I was learning and, and, and getting taught at my United were completely different to, to what I was learning and getting taught at, at Burnley. And then there's finding the balance. I mean, everyone's all for a, a good footballer and a, and, a, and, a, and a good football and centre back. But, you know, I think looking at the looking at the Premier League now, even people, people really need good defenders in their team that are going to try and keep clean sheets. And that's something that before I'd become a a really good football and centre half that I really want to master. I, I want to master defending and master both boxes and and become really good at that first and foremost. Um, and then and then be able to develop the football side of things, which I am. And you know, at my United, that that was probably primarily what what we were trying to develop at, at Burnley. The other way around, we were trying to develop our our defensive skills, um, which I feel is, is more important for, for now. Anyway. You got a good baptism of fire as well. You got the goal against Leicester, but your first two yeah. games, you're going up against probably the two hottest strikers in the Premier League, the two hottest out and out strikers in the Premier League, and Jamie Vardy <laughs> and Danny Ings. Uh, what's Vardy like to play against? Yeah, like I had to learn learn quickly. Like um, they're 
two strikers in the sense that you don't want to give them space in behind. Um, the first goal we conceded against Leicester, uh, Vardy got a bit of space in behind, and the first goal we conceded against um, Southampton was they, they got a little bit of space in behind. So that's one thing that is completely different. Now I know now in the Premier League to other to other leagues where I could maybe be a bit more aggressive and, and press in on the, whoever's floating in the number 10 kind of slot a bit more because it has to be a really, really good pass to be able to slide one right down the side there perfectly weighted for them to get in but obviously at, at, at this level that's that's easy for them so um that's something i've just had to learn at two games in that's probably the biggest game biggest thing i've taken from it is um to not give up the space in behind me mm. is vardy a talker during the game i he just i think he just is playing football on the park with his mates I right <laughs> Don't think he thinks any different of it than that. You can get um, sense he's rubbing his hands with glee when he sees a 22-year-old making his debut. Yeah, look, I'm sure like these guys are are ruthless. They want to score as many goals as possible. So, um, I'm sure when he sees that, that there's a, a newcomer involved who hasn't done it before, he, he wants to capitalise on it. So, at least he didn't score in that game. I know a couple <laughs> of other guys did, but at least he kept him quiet for that one. Were you nervous? Um. I played in the Sheffield United game mm. in the, uh, a couple of days before, and from there the games came quite quite quick. There was like two games a week: it went Sheffield United, Leicester, and um, Millwall, and Southampton. And it it was like that that two weeks just I can't believe how fast it went. Um, I don't really think I was that nervous. Maybe maybe before the Sheffield United game because that was my debut. Um, I just wanted to go out super aggressive and, and do what I do, um, but after that I felt like I probably wasn't thinking at all. I just I just went in and, and tried to enjoy the games, and do the best I can for the team. I was delighted to see you get that game against Leicester because I was watching at the end of last season, game after game, you're yeah. on the bench and Sean Dyche, as we know, is not a man for sentiment. And I was looking at that last game of the season, <laughs> thinking, I think he'd been on the bench nine games straight. Yeah. There's nothing to play for. So he's definitely going to throw him on for 10 minutes. Give the kid a go. Who knows what's going to happen in the rest of his career? Give him that Premier League experience. And no, nothing. Like, Are you in his ear going, come on, boss, please? Or do you just know that Sean Dyche is not the type of character who's for turning, who makes changes for the sake of making changes? Absolutely, I would not be in the office here. <laughs> no, it's a thing. Um, like there's a there's a there's a real compliment in that as well because I mean the the gaffer's not really just going to hand out debuts. So mm. I, I, the most positive way I can look at it is to, to to get a debut under under the gaffer. I'm really really proud of because it must have been earned. Um, it, like I said, that that game there's. I think Norwich had nine men and we were two nil up and the season had finished and there was nothing to play for. But um he obviously didn't feel the need just to, to hand out a debut. It's not that simple uh to play at this level. Um uh, during lockdown and after lockdown and after I came back from fleet where I walked my socks off, I tried to train train my hardest and, and help the team out as much as possible and, and then the opportunity arised where um Tarky wasn't ready yet and Ben weren't ready yet. Um and then I got my opportunity, which I'm delighted and really grateful for. You mentioned leaving United have been a pretty slight young lad, unsurprisingly. Like, Tarkowski and me are, are two players who are, look, they're constantly been linked with other clubs because they're yeah. really good quality footballing centre backs. But they're two big, tough men as well. Over the lockdown and coming back to Burnley, like, are you physically, do you feel you're there now, even though you still are, what, 22 at this stage? To be a Premier League yeah. centre back, do you feel physically you're ready for that? Yeah, I think um, physically was a massive thing for me. There's, there was, uh, like I'm 22 now, but I've probably only just finished growing or finishing growing. There's a lot of changes going on in your body, uh, you know, when when you're still growing. Um, and I was I was always kind of late developing that way. Um, so only now at, at my age have I kind of started beginning to fill out a little bit. And it's taken a lot of work in the gym to try and coordinate um, myself and improving my agility to be able to keep up with guys who are probably a lot smaller than me but um rapid and of, of really quick feet mm. um so it's taken it's taken a lot of work I, i've done a lot of work at home with uh graham Byrne at sports ireland we do a lot of work, work stuff for that when i go home in the off season um and then work on my upper body as much as i can and um, but probably only now do i feel really physically ready to compete with some of like i can't imagine what playing against andy carroll or someone like that so that must be like <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, I'm gonna go up high with the elbows possible. first I, sus- I suspect is what you need to be <laughs> yeah. doing that would be tough that would be really tough but yeah like uh, I do feel now that I'm, I'm kind of growing into my body and I'm becoming more ready like there's been so many goals at the start of the season and oh, I do look at it like football I know there's many different reasons but attacking play and the speed of the Premier League is just insane right now uh, unless you're probably at games all the time you're not fully appreciating just how technically yeah. gifted these attacking players are that one of the reasons for yeah. more goals as well is that like, I know defenders are improving but forward play seems to have improved exponentially over the last couple of years that it's just so quick that it's practically impossible for centre half some of the time Oh yeah, like some some of the goals in the Leicester game, I, I genuinely was, was scratching my head. I, I didn't actually know really how we could have stopped one or two of them. There's there's usually always like someone that's put a foot wrong in some places. Like a, I watched the, the goal we can see it against Southampton a couple of times and it's literally, I spoke with, with Longy straight after the game and it was literally, if I had taken a step backwards instead of the step forwards, the goal probably wouldn't have happened. Like, and it's that detail um that i've had to uh, i've had to try and learn and um and, uh, and then it, then again when they get in front of the when they get in front of the goal the quality is so good that they'll, they'll punish you whereas in league one um a lot of the time you could maybe get away with a couple of things and um, the keeper would say but they put a shot yeah. wide or whatever at this level they don't they, they put a top corner like so you mentioned kevin out. long there you, you were playing uh, together an all-irish center half pairing like the yeah. one thing we know with sean dyche is he doesn't make changes and there was speculation James Tarkowski may leave, he didn't, he's going to be back to full yeah. fitness. Ben Mee is back to full fitness. I, I always go back to a story, Stephen Ward was doing commentary with us one Christmas in 2015, mm-hmm. was at Burnley, thought he might have to go out and loan, Claire gets injured, I think he played every game for the next two and a half years, and then he gets yeah. injured and he's out and he doesn't get back in. When you're in, you when you're in with Sean Dye, like, is there? what are your feelings for the season? Are you... Are you happy getting your bits and pieces of game time and been around that Premier League match day experience, or do you feel you need to be out getting games again, maybe a championship level? What 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 what's your thoughts for yeah. what happened this season? Yeah, like look, I've, I've opted to go out and play for the last two or three seasons, and I've uh, and I've it's been probably a good good decision for me because you don't want to sit around like I did during the last season and never play as good as the experience is. Um, and I do need to play loads of football, but I always kind of say to myself, you're not going to play Premier League if you're not at a Premier League club and you're not in a round. Of, you know, if you're not there, you're definitely not going to get the chance. So I do feel like it comes to a stage where you are going to have to sit tight and, and really give playing in the Premier League a go. Maybe if it gets to the stage where it's, you know, it's ridiculous and, and the opportunity isn't coming and you might feel as like, OK, I, I need to go. I might need to go and play somewhere here for a while and get back up and going again. But for now, it's the start of the season. It's a long season. I'm delighted to have been given an opportunity, and I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna push for more and and, and wait for more, um, and hopefully, hopefully get another chance and take it again in the next few months. What was the last week like? Seeing Kevin Long called up, seeing Daryl Shea called into the squad. Were you waiting by the phone? Were you thinking there might be a, a senior call up because you've been around the senior squad before? Uh, to be honest, yeah, I didn't really, didn't really um, think about it, like. I try not to compare myself to others too much. Like obviously, um, Longy is a really experienced centre back now. He's played. He's been at Burnley for like ten years, and mm. he's he's been in loads of Ireland squads. Um, and obviously, like D- Dara, like I, I know Dara. Dara's absolutely flying, doing absolutely brilliant. Um, I thought he did brilliant in his, in his debut the, the other night. And um, to be honest, I'm delighted for these guys. I, I do know like the the international thing does take care of itself. If I if I keep development at, at my club. Um, and doing as doing as well as I can here, then then hopefully that opportunity will come up and I'll I'll grab it with both hands. Uh, for now, definitely all I need to concentrate on is is my club football. Um, Stephen Kenny obviously uh, Stephen Kenny obviously had huge success in your hometown. Were you, were you around Dundalk yeah. during the Kenny era? Do, do you know him at all? Um, I actually the the only reason why I I know Stephen Kenny is because a, a couple of years ago I think it was the the summer I got released from Man United. I wanted to try and keep fit, and I, and I knew Dundalk were doing really well at the time, and I I got Stephen Kenny's number off of somebody, and I I asked him could I, would he mind if I came in and and trained with Dundalk and and kept myself fit and kept myself training, and he was he was brilliant. He was said absolutely yeah, we'd love to have you in. I trained all the guys, um, you know, and I I spoke to him. I learned loads. The lads were like really flying, really fit at the time. 
and then they went and won the league and and I went to Burnley that summer and that's um that's how I know so I know Stephen and obviously the whole the whole town uh, is still delighted with how <laughs> how well that era went and how important it is for the town it's a real soccer town it's a, it's a real real footy town so um it was massive for them um but yeah that's that's the only reason I know I know Stephen and um I know how well he I know how much he, he loves the the youth and the connection he has with them so it's it's great to see the the younger lads stepping up as well yeah. So Monday night then, uh, West Brom against Burnley. Hopefully, both yourself and yeah. Darrow share play. You're you're a year older than Darrow, so you didn't play together when yeah. you were Kevin's. Uh, I'm sure we played together at some stage. Uh, at some stage, but we, yeah, I am older. I'm a year older than Darrow, so we probably didn't at Kevin's. Yeah, but you know, you know um, each other quite well by the sounds of it. I know. I, I'm not. Yeah, I know. I know Darrow. We've you know football is a small world. We've played with with each other and against each other on trials and stuff like that. So yeah. Well, um, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to catch up with him on Monday. Yeah, uh, Jimmy, it's been great to talk to you. It sounds like you're loving life at the moment, as much as anyone can. Working hard, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, there's frustrations, but yeah, we crack on. Yeah, Jimmy, great stuff. Well, best of luck with the rest of the season. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks a million. Bye bye. Bye bye. Football on off the ball with Paddy Power. New normal, same old football. Paddy Power. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie. News Talk Breakfast. What message would you have to third level students this morning? I know you can't live under a rock. Um, so I fully endorse the USI campaign, which is saying when you do socialise, do three things. Yeah, keep it safe, keep it small, and keep your distance. So do meet your friend, do go for that walk, do have that cup of coffee outdoors. But obviously don't, you know, don't jam-pack a load of people into a house. So it's common sense, but the government's not lecturing you, uh, pardon the pun. The government wants to work with you, and I actually think students have worked really hard with us, and I think they've suffered an awful lot. News Talk Breakfast with Kira Kelly and Shane Coleman. In association with AIR. Weekday mornings at 7 on News Talk. Anne had been training hard for months, 7K most evenings in all weathers, along familiar tree-lined roads. Only for that wind to be close to my fastest time ever. Just what I need, a fallen tree. OK, climb over, keep moving. Always ask yourself the question. Are you sure it's safe? Never approach fallen wires. Stay safe, stay clear of electricity wires. For emergencies, call 1-800-372-999. ESB Networks, serving all electricity customers. Like every rural county, we were dying for air to come. The business really, really needed it, so we haven't looked back since. It's been brilliant. That's Lee Williams, co-owner of the Wicklow Brewery and Happy Air Business customer. Get air gigabit fibre broadband from €30 Euro a month. Call 1-800-400-555. Air, let's make possible. Subject to availability, 30 euro a month for the first four months, 55 euro a month thereafter, XVAT. 24 month minimum contract period for one gigabit FTTP. Early cease charges may apply. Offer available for a limited time. For full details and terms, see business.air.ie. Certainty. With Volkswagen commercial vehicles, it's included as standard. The Crafter, Transporter and the all-new fifth generation Caddy are more innovative, dynamic and efficient than ever before. Now with HP Finance from 0%. Purchase contributions of up to €3,500 and service plans from €9.99. They're the smart next step for your business. For vans and offers you can rely on always, contact your local Volkswagen commercial vehicles dealer or visit volkswagenvans.ie and leave the rest to us. Finance provided by way of higher purchase agreement from Volkswagen Financial Services Ireland and subject to lending criteria. Terms and conditions apply. Strange times, we say. They certainly are. But we take heart from the spirit people are showing. Looking out for neighbours. Thinking about what really matters. And right now, around the country, good people are working to produce great tasting Irish food brands. Local products you can really trust. So when you shop, you can support thousands of Irish jobs and businesses by looking for the Love Irish Food Heart. So next time you're shopping, have a heart. Love Irish food. Are you looking to get fit and need that extra push? At Harvey Norman, we have a huge range of connected fitness and health products that will help you monitor and reach your fitness goals. Like the brand new Fitbit Sense, the advanced smartwatch that makes you smart about your health. With tools for heart health, stress management, skin temperature trends and so much more. Available now for only €329. Euro. Visit us in store or online at harveynorman.ie forward slash Fitbit to shop our full range. Go, this October, watch the big games every weekend with Sky Sports and Sports Extra, half price. 
This week, it's Man City Arsenal live only on Sky Sports. The Apprentice oh, the side has shown real character. takes on the master. Pep Guardiola's Manchester City history makers. Get Sky Sports, BT Sport and Premier Sports half price for six months. Search Sky Sports Sale. New sports customers only. Standard pricing applies after six months or if cancelling one element of the bundle. Minimum term and further terms apply. Football on Off The Ball. With Paddy Power. Minimal contact in stadiums shouldn't stop the usual suspects from going down. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie Jimmy Dunne, what an impressive young man he is. 22 years of age, just made his Premier League debut. And uh, yeah, really interesting story from his time at Manchester United with Marcus Rashford and any amount of underage talent. Dean Henderson was there as well. Left United, goes to Burnley, goes out and loan, goes all over England and finally gets his reward and no doubt I think is going to be part of Ireland squads to come. Uh, Enda Call from Team 33 is with us as well. Evening Enda. Nathan, what's the crack? The man who booked uh, Jimmy Dunn and I said, it's Ireland talk, it's the day after the match, we've got to talk Ireland. He said, Jimmy Dunn, you've got to talk to Jimmy Dunn. You got that one right. Listen, it's uh, we, we spoke to a couple of these young Irish players coming through, you know, Jason Malumby, Dara O'Shea, and now Jimmy Dunn. And what I've noticed from most of them is that they are incredibly confident. And do you know what? That's that's a great thing to see. Because for too long we've been thinking that, you know, maybe Ireland, Ireland players have been put down by so many managers that their confidence is just shot. But we're seeing now that there's a generation of young Irish people that are full of confidence in their own ability. And they're showing it now in the Premier League, which is, it's, it's going to bode well for Stephen Kenny, even though the last week hasn't been great. Uh, no, and it's funny because you can get access quite often to the younger players, the under-21 players, a bit, with a bit more ease than the established internationals. And quite often, through the years, you go, do I want to talk? Because mostly 20, 21-year-olds, let's be honest, don't have a huge amount to say for themselves. But we've now spoken, as you say, to Malumbi, to Jason Knight, to Conor Masterson, uh, to Adam Ida. And all of these players are eloquent, uh, they have a lot to say for themselves, they're able to talk about their journey, they're able to talk about football in a really smart, insightful way. And as talented as they are as well, you just feel that it's going to be a good camp over the coming years. I, it's going to be brilliant. And it's, it, you know, I suppose one thing you mentioned there is do young people often, they don't have a lot to say about themselves. But I suppose the likes of Jimmy Dunn there, it shows that uh, he's he's currently breaking into the Burnley side, so he he might not be as media, uh, you know, as media trained as some of the older players. So like if you're if you're talking to a player who's been playing the Premier League for for ten thirteen years, they have done every interview, they've done the live chat, they've done all this all they know all the tricks of the trade, and they don't want to give anything away. So they often give out really boring interviews. So. When you when you when you sit down and chat to someone like Jimmy Dunn, who's so open with his journey and talking about his journey through the lower leagues and and then right up to Mark and Jamie Vardy, that's what people want to hear ultimately. And ultimately, it makes them more open to the public as well, makes them more relatable. And I think when they get onto the pitch, it, people are less likely to judge them as harshly the more they know them. And I suppose that's what's missing in uh, Premier League football right now. There's the connection between the fans and the players has got to the extent where pe people don't really know the players anymore, whereas the younger Irish players, people are starting to get to know them and they really like them and they really like the football they want to play as well. So it's a, it's a bright future for Irish f football on that front as well. Uh, our listeners, I'm sure, all know Enda from Fridays, where he's Mr. Friday here and off the ball from Team 33 every Friday night at 9 o'clock, the Paddy Power half hour. He also has a little side, little side gig going on as well. What are you calling it these days? Uh, it's it's been through a multiple number of t uh, names so far, but calling it with end of call is calling the it uh, with end of call. So you can get this on YouTube. Uh, he just goes off. He does it by himself. Puts all his best stuff there. His little rants and his raves. Won't give it to the off the ball audience, and that's just fine. But give us a little insight then into what Enda has uh, made. Call it and uh, on what you made of Ireland over the past week. I thought they've been pretty good. I mean, anybody who's looked at that and come out with the opinion that Ireland aren't on the right track or aren't trying to do th something a little bit different doesn't really understand football to the extent where they can't see the fact that Ireland are, you know, they're trying to pass it out from the back when ultimately under previ previous regimes they wouldn't have. And uh, there was one point in the game where the, uh, the Finland players were on the break 
and the Irish defence were all getting back. And it, every single one of the four defenders were running at the exact same pace in the exact same line. There is shape to this team now. They have a real outlook of what they want to do. Yes, we do need to start breaking down teams more. And I kind of get what John Giles was saying, that we need to actually have cause and effect. I think that the midfielders at the minute aren't brave enough on the ball. They're not turning. They're getting the ball and then they're passing it back. They're not being uh, inventive enough. But I do think that will come. And the results, I do think, will follow down, maybe not down the next couple of months, but down the next couple of years. Irish football will benefit from having Stephen Kenny at the helm. And even just down through the the different sectors in Irish football where we're no longer training our under-13s or under-15s or under-16s to kick the ball long. We're, we're training them to play out from the back. And there will be a, a progression of players over the next couple of years that will be tuned to play this football as opposed to trying to train the likes of Shane Duffy who didn't really play it, trying to change, change the way that Jeff Hendrick uses the ball. You know, we're trying to change players who are already established pros, whereas in a couple, in a couple of years' time, every player that we have in that team will be trained to play that t t type of football. So I think it's going to be a long road, but it will be worth doing. Yeah, it's interesting what John was saying, well, maybe not that far off in some ways from what Vinnie Perth was saying yesterday, that Ireland need that creative number 10, and it's a sad irony that the one time we have a manager who's probably crying out for that player doesn't have one, when we've had so many of down over the last 10, 15 years who could play in that position who we didn't use. And it's hard to see, even coming through, and things can change quickly, a player can emerge quite quickly, that we don't have as good as I think Jeff Hendrick has actually played in that role. He's not that creator who's going to pick out the pass in behind at the right time. So. Look, there's probably going to be some more tough days to come for Stephen Kenny. I would agree with you, but uh, listen, here, we're Kenny sympathisers, as I've been told. Well, that's it. We're just... Uh, we're, we're now... We've gone from uh, being biased against the League of Ireland to be bi biased towards it. But uh, I, I don't know if you saw James Rodriguez chatting during the week. There was a clip going around of him talking about how the number 10 has actually disappeared from world football and how in the 80s and early 90s it was the most popular position and now there are no number 10s and no manager likes under 10s, I think, or, or number 10, sorry. So it, it was almost like a, a, a veiled dig at Zinedine Zidane, the fact that he wouldn't play him in his actual position. But it, it, is, it was an interesting point. The, the, the current systems that are being played in football, they're really uh, tuned towards the fast, aggressive, athletic players out in the wing that can burst into the box and it's it's really tuned towards 11 players and playing in one system rather than one creative player but r really what Ireland do need is that number 10 that can get in the ball turn and p play a pass what what Ireland actually reminded me of against uh, Wales on Sunday was so almost like the United team under Louis van Gaal where they were getting the ball they were passing across the defense and then it would get to the midfield and the midfielders wouldn't be brave enough to take the ball on the turn burst forward a couple of yards and then play the pass through. They were just kind of getting the ball, they were facing away from the goal and they were playing it back to the defender and it was it was just sort of, it was possession for the sake of possession, kind of like what John Giles was saying. It, it just needs that little bit more progression, but I do think that will come. Yeah, let's hope it ends better than Louis van Gaal at Manchester United. Uh, just a couple of news lines to bring you then. Um, you mentioned the League of Ireland, uh, the breaking story tonight is that three Shamrock Rovers games have been called off their next three matches because uh, there's been a COVID outbreak within the squad. There's two players confirmed. Jack Byrne was one of them. He missed the Ireland game because of that. And Aaron Green as well. And a lot of that squad have been classified as close contacts. So their next three games have been called off. A Bohemians player has also tested positive for COVID, but they are going to go ahead, it seems, with their game against Dundalk tomorrow night so we keep you up to date on that on otbsports.com Premier League is back this weekend and quite a weekend we've got a Merseyside derby where Everton are top of the league going against the Liverpool side who just conceded seven goals that is the first game of the weekend and that is early on Saturday we've Manchester City against Arsenal as well at half past five all of that as always on football on a Saturday afternoon here on Off the Ball and then our two live commentaries on Sunday Crystal Palace against Brighton from two o'clock and then Spurs against West Ham from half four and a quickly what you got in Team 33 tomorrow? Tomorrow we have, I'm, I'm uh, chatting to Darren O'Dea, uh, head of the first Old Firm, or the Glasgow Derby as it's now been called. Celtic fans don't like calling it the Old Firm anymore apparently. So I'm um, chatting to Darren O'Dea about what it's like to actually play in one of those games. And Kieran Bradley will be speaking to the lads from the Socially Distant Sports Bar, a podcast that kind of sprang up in the middle of this. So that's all coming up at uh, 9 o'clock tomorrow night. 
Calling it once again. Good calling man. it with end of call. Smash that subscribe button, Nathan. Oh, That's no, what I'm calling to all the off the buttons. Smash ads, the get subscribe to ads, button. Ads, ads, get rid of them. Football on off the ball with Paddy Power. New normal, same old football. Paddy Power. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie. Harvey Norman, celebrating 17 years in Ireland with our best prices across our biggest range. Shop in our spacious stores or online for big deals like the Bosch Induction Hob, now just 369, saving a massive 240 euro. Plus, claim a free set of pots when you buy this hob. Or get the Russell Hobbs Power Steam Ultra Iron with vertical steam function, now just 39.95. And we're matching all competitors' prices, even their sale prices. Harvey Norman, your appliances, technology, furniture, and bedding specialists. Right now, at the AA, we're offering 100 euro of car insurance when you purchase online and up to 10% off your quote when you buy AA membership. Who's got clever car insurance? For our best value car insurance, go online to the AA.ie. Terms and conditions apply. Minimum premium of 280 euro applies. New business policies only. AA Ireland Limited Trading as AA Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. If you're looking for a new car, choose brighter with Seat. Like the new Ateca with Seat Connect, a seamless link between your smartphone and your car. Or the new Tobacco FR, bringing another level of design and sportiness to Ireland's large SUV of the year. And there's the all-new Leon, our most connected and widely praised car by Irish motoring journalists. You can choose either PCB finance from just 0% or an online scrappage voucher worth up to €5,000. And you can choose a three-year service plan for just 9 99 a month. The new Seat Ateca and the 211 Seat range. Choose brighter. Finance provided by way of hard purchase agreement from Volkswagen Financial Services Ireland trading as Seat Financial Services. Subject to lending criteria. Terms and conditions apply. Visit seat.ie for further information. The online world is great, but occasionally it's good to step outside of it. Why not swap your screens and devices for family fun and take a cyber break? Join CyberSafe Ireland and families across Ireland from 5pm on Friday the 16th of October and take a 24-hour